Hello, welcome. On this particular session of pharmacology, we are going to discuss the antiviral agents. Antiviral agents is a pretty long topic and we won't be able to finish it in one session. But we will start the antiviral agents and then we will complete the non-retroviral diseases on this particular session and you will have to go to another session to listen to the retroviral that's HIV AIDS. So antiviral agents for non-retroviral diseases and for retroviral diseases. Now come back to the slide. The non-retroviral diseases that we are going to consider is herpes and cytomegalovirus that's CMV, then influenza, then hepatitis B and C and RSV that's respiratory syncytial virus. Down I have written retroviral diseases and there you have HIV AIDS. So we will concentrate, we will focus on the non-retroviral diseases and what are the various antiviral agents available. What are the mechanisms of action in general of the antiviral agents? You have a table here and as far as a virus is concerned, there are various things happening in the virus which leads to the DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, so on and so forth and the thing starts with the entry of the virus into the human cell. So the left side is telling you the mechanism of action and on the right side there are examples of drugs who are practicing this particular mechanism of action as their antiviral action. In the first box there is inhibition of viral fusion or viral attachment or viral entry and viral penetration. All these drugs are shown in front of this particular box. There is a new drug called Enfuvertide and this gets attached to GP41. So Enfuvertide is a new drug in HIV AIDS. So it, it comes under inhibition of viral fusion or attachment or entry. Next you have Maraviroc that is a CCR5 receptor antagonist Maraviroc. This is also a new agent in HIV AIDS. Then you have gamma globulins, you have docosanol useful in HSV, you have palivizumab which is used against the respiratory syncytial virus and you have interferon alpha used for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So all these drugs they are having the target of preventing the viral fusion, attachment entry or the penetration of virus. After the viral, viral entry, there is uncoating, there is viral uncoating and if you want to block this viral uncoating, there could be various mechanisms. One of the mechanisms is to block the viral membrane matrix protein called M2, blocking the viral membrane matrix protein called M2 and if you block this, you can inhibit the viral uncoating. Which drugs do this? On the right hand side there are drugs, there is amantadine and there is remantadine. These drugs are used in the management of influenza, amantadine and remantadine. I will remind you amantadine is also an anti-Parkinson agent, so that is this amantadine. Next we go to the next step, there is going to be the action of the viral DNA polymerase enzyme, so there, there, is, there is going to be the polymerization. The drugs which inhibit the viral DNA polymerase are acyclovir, janciclovir and foscarnate. The various drugs in the group of acyclovir with similar structure are most probably the viral DNA polymerase inhibitors. The next one is viral RNA polymerase inhibitors. Viral RNA polymerase inhibitors. And in this group you have foscarnate again and ribavirin. Just take a breath and look at this particular row and the earlier row. Viral DNA polymerase, acyclovir, janciclovir and foscarnate and viral RNA polymerase, foscarnate and ribavirin. So what happened is the foscarnate came at both the places. You need to remember this, foscarnate has got both the actions. It's a viral DNA polymerase inhibitor as well as viral RNA polymerase inhibitor. Now we go to the next group and this next group is very relevant as far as the HIV AIDS is concerned. And these drugs are called 
रिवर्स ट्रांसक्रिप्टिस इनिबिटर्स आर टी आईज और रिवर्स ट्रांसक्रिप्टिस इनिबिटर्स दे इनिबिट द एंजाइम रिवर्स ट्रांसक्रिप्टिस नेम्स ऑफ द ड्रग्स आर जीडोव्यूडिन जीडोव्यूडिन इज ऑल्सो अब्रीवेटेड कॉमनली एज ए जी टी देन यू हैव डायडाइनोसिन जालसिटबिन लैमिव्यूडिन एंड स्टेव्यूडिन एंड यू ऑल्सो हैव नेबिरापिन डेलाविडिन एंड इफाबीरेंस द ड्रग्स जीडोव्यूडिन डायडाइनोसिन जालसिटबिन लैमिव्यूडिन स्टेव्यूडिन आर द न्यूक्लियोसाइड रिवर्स ट्रांसक्रिप्टिस इनिबिटर्स so they are called as nrtis whereas the last three drugs nevirapine delavirdin and efavirenz are non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors so they are called nnrtis non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors we go to the next box there is late protein synthesis and there is an enzyme in the virus aspartate protease which helps to cut and shape the proteins so that's aspartate protease enzyme there are drugs which can inhibit this aspartate protease and because they inhibit the enzyme protease they are commonly called protease inhibitors and the abbreviation is capital p and capital i pi's protease inhibitors examples of the drug indinavir ritonavir sakvinavir nelfinavir lopinavir and atazinavir nicely rhyming drugs if you look at them all of them are ending with navir so many times they are called navirs n a v i r s like you have celecoxib rofecoxib in the anti inflammatory drugs and you call them coxibs these drugs could be called as navirs so whenever there is the spelling ending with n a v i r you will be sure that the mechanism of action will be inhibition of aspartate protease and this group is going to be the protease inhibitor next we come to another enzyme that's neuraminidase and if the drug is able to inhibit the enzyme neuraminidase in the virus then you have these drugs which are useful in the management of influenza that's zanamivir and oseltamivir i am sure you are aware of the word tamiflu the drug used for influenza tamiflu that tamiflu is zanamivir or oseltamivir so these are the neuraminidase inhibitors finally the last row is inhibiting integrase so the viral integrase inhibitors again this is a new agent that's called raltegravir what i would advise you to do is just make a list of the mechanism of action the various steps of the viral replication don't write anything in front of it go to each of the boxes stretch your memory and try to memorize what drugs are likely to be there your brain itself would give you some clues and you would slowly start solving it i can give you some hints those drugs which are used for non retroviral diseases ercyclovir and its derivatives they are dna polymerase and when you put ercyclovir chancyclovir in front of the viral dna polymerase you can also put foscarnet and next you can go down and put foscarnet also in front of viral rna polymerase so at least two boxes will be filled and you are going to remember the names if you remember about tamy flu and if you remember about the swine flu then probably you will remember neuraminidase and the names of the drugs is zanamivir and oseltamivir then you can think about reverse transcriptase inhibitors there are too many names reverse transcriptase inhibitors pseudobutin diadenosin etc and the protease inhibitors are the navirs indinavir ritonavir sakvinavir etc you need to remember the newer agents which have come in the antiviral therapy and at least three newer agents from this table you need to remember one is enfuvertide which combines with the gp41 envelope protein next one is marabi rock which is a ccr5 antagonist and the third one i advise you to remember is the last drug on this table that's raltegravir is a new agent and it is an integrase inhibitor so this is regarding the various mechanisms of action of the drug and how the drug is going to interfere 
in the viral replication. What's the common mechanism of action behind all these effects of the antiviral drugs? Most of the antiviral drugs act at the stage of nucleic acid synthesis. So all those drugs who are going to interfere with the nucleic acid synthesis or they can act at the late protein synthesis and processing, whatever might be the case, they finally inhibit the viral replication. And since they are inhibiting the viral replication, you can consider them as anti-metabolite substances or anti-metabolite drugs. So I am saying the common hidden mechanism under all these mechanisms could be the anti-metabolite effect. There is another peculiarity of antiviral agents. Most of the antiviral drugs, they are not active as it is. When we take the drug, the drug is not active. It is in inactive form and it needs to get converted into active forms. I am making a general statement that the drugs are inactive and they need to get activated. The activation is done by the reaction of phosphorylation by the various kinase enzymes. The active forms are usually triphosphate derivatives. So there has to be a triphosphorylation of the original substance which we have consumed and the drug needs to get converted into triphosphate derivative. Now for this particular phosphorylation, the drug may need an enzyme and from where this enzyme should come. The enzyme can come from the host cell, that's your patient or and the enzyme can come from the viral cell. So you are going to give the drug to your patient. The patient has a virus inside his body. The drug is going to get activated by one of the two mechanisms or both. It's going to take an enzyme from the host cell and get activated a bit. Then it also need an enzyme from the viral cell. And it's always the kinase enzyme. We already said kinase and phosphorylation. So that's very peculiar about the antiviral drugs. They are inactive and they take enzyme from the human cell or they take the enzyme from the viral cell and then they get activated into triphosphate forms. Let's have an example of conversion. You can have a look at the slide. Zeudobutin is AZT. This is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor used in HIV disease, right? This drug gets activated into its triphosphate form. How? This drug gets activated by the kinase enzyme which is coming from the host cell. So that's from the patient. So that's the example of conversion, how zeudovidin gets activated to triphosphate form. It needs the enzyme only from the host cell. Let's have the second example. There is a drug called acyclovir which is used commonly for HSV and this acyclovir gets first phosphorylated by the viral thymidine kinase. It means for the first step of phosphorylation it needs an enzyme which is coming from the virus. So it takes thymidine kinase from the virus it gets first phosphorylated then it also needs the second enzyme this second enzyme should come from the host cell so I am calling it host cell kinase and this is how acyclovir will be completely activated. So if you look at these two drugs and think a bit zeudobutin, the whole brunt of zeudobutin is coming on the host cell kinase it's not taking anything from the virus it's not getting activated by the viral kinase whereas acyclovir needs both the enzymes it first needs the viral thymidine kinase and then it needs the host cell kinase. Naturally the brunt of acyclovir gets divided into these two enzymes, the host cell and the viral cell. And this is why acyclovir is likely to be less toxic as compared to zeudobutin. What we derive from this is right and if you go to practice and see, yes, acyclovir is comparatively less toxic and the more toxic substance is zeudobutin which is the mainstay of treatment in HIV disease. So we discuss about acyclovir now. We have a discussion about acyclovir. Acyclovir is useful against HSV 
1 and 2 and it's also useful against HSV3. Have a look at the slide. It's written in the title of the slide that it's useful against these infections. HSV1 and 2 and HSV3. HSV3 is nothing but varicella zoster virus. That's VZB. Includes herpes zoster and includes chickenpox. So once again to say this acyclovir gets converted by the viral thymidine kinase into monophosphate form first. Then it takes the enzyme from the host cell that's the host cell kinase and gets converted into triphosphate form which is a nucleotide. And then this inhibits the viral DNA polymerase. So that's the mechanism of action of a cyclovir. It inhibits the viral DNA polymerase. After incorporation into the DNA molecule, a cyclovir acts as a DNA chain terminator. So that's regarding the mechanism of action of a cyclovir. We continue with the discussion of a cyclovir. It's given by oral route of administration and has got a short half-life. So there is good frequency of administration. You need to take a cyclovir five times a day. It's also given by intravenous route of administration and also by topical administration. Uses of acyclovir include obviously HSV1 that's mucocutaneous herpes, genital herpes, herpes encephalitis and keratitis. It's also useful for HSV prophylaxis in the immune compromised hosts. And the third use will be HSV3 that's VZB or varicella zoster this includes herpes zoster and chickenpox. So these are the uses of a cyclovir. What are the adverse effects? When it's applied topically, it leads to burning sensation and stinging sensation. This is known. When it's used by oral route of administration, look at the slide. It's ANV. These are my abbreviations. ANV stands for anorexia, nausea and vomiting. And when I write H, it's headache. So anorexia, nausea, vomiting and headache what you commonly call as gastrointestinal disturbances. Ocyclovir precipitate seizures in susceptible patients can lead to delirium, can lead to hallucinations and tremor. So it has certain central nervous system adverse effects. When you give it by intravenous route of administration, it can precipitate skin rashes, vomiting and you can expect a fall in blood pressure. You need to keep a watch on the patient. Next, there is dose dependent decrease in the glomerular filtration rate and this can lead to crystal urea. So you need to take a precaution if your patient has diminished renal function. What's the speciality of acyclovir? We have been saying it's, it's comparatively safer or it's less toxic than pseudovudine. What we are talking about? We are talking about bone marrow separation. I hope you understand you expect all these drugs to have selective toxicity to the viral cell but this cannot be assured if there's a toxicity of these particular substances to your host cell then the rapidly multiplying cells are going to get affected first and the rapidly multiplying cell is your bone marrow and naturally there could be bone marrow separation with the use of many drugs pseudobutin is very potent in producing bone marrow separation so, when we say a cyclovir is less toxic, probably we are targeting this issue of bone marrow separation. A cyclovir is a drug which produces minimal hematotoxicity or when I say hematotoxicity, it means bone marrow separation. There are similar drugs in this group which are better and they have got a longer duration of action. For example, FAM cyclovir which is used in VZV and Vala cyclovir and you have pen cyclovir which is used by topical routes of administration. What about the resistance to a cyclovir? Yes, there could be resistance strains to a cyclovir and let's go to the mechanism of development of resistance. The first mechanism in 50% of the organisms is the resistance is due to TK minus strains. Please have a look at the slide, then you would realize what I have shown on the slide. 
What is this TK? Any guess? TK stands for thymidine kinase. Just now we said the drug has to get activated by the viral enzyme, right? The enzyme is thymidine kinase. So the drug to become active needs an enzyme from the virus. And if the virus decides that I am not going to give this enzyme, obviously the drug cannot get activated. And this particular organism then is going to be resistant to the action of the drug. What the organisms did was they understood that the drug is using my thymidine kinase. So could I do something so that I eliminate this thymidine kinase from my own cell and the virus has decided yes, let's eliminate thymidine kinase. It could be a mutation and there could be viruses who do not have thymidine kinase enzyme at all. I hope you are appreciating. There will be viruses who do not have thymidine kinase enzyme at all. Then I am going to call these viruses as TK minus strains because they don't have thymidine kinase enzyme. And if you don't have thymidine kinase enzyme, the drug cannot get activated and the virus will be resistant. So that's the first mechanism resistance due to the TK minus strains and in 50% of the organisms this is the mechanism which is practiced. The second mechanism practiced will be obviously based on the mechanism of action of the drug. The drug is inhibiting DNA polymerase. So what the organism is going to do is going to decrease its sensitivity of the DNA polymerase to the drug and then the drug won't be able to bind to DNA polymerase and the inhibition will not happen. The next drug in the group of acyclovir is Janciclovir. This is used for CMV retinitis. It's used by intravenous route and as intraocular implants. Janciclovir does produce some hematotoxicity, that's bone marrow suppression, and it also produces neurotoxicity. And just like the previous drug, you have to monitor the renal function. If the renal function is diminished, then you need to reduce the dose of this drug, that's Janciclovir. Next we move on to Foscarnet and let's try and find out, do you remember anything about Foscarnet which we did with the first slide of this particular presentation. If you don't remember, let me remind you, there were two enzymes, DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase, viral DNA polymerase and viral RNA polymerase. And the viral DNA polymerase by, was mainly inhibited by acyclovir and the group of drugs. And on this row, there was first carnet. When we went down to the viral RNA polymerase, again, first carnet appeared there. I hope you remembered. So that's first carnet. Inhibits DNA polymerase as well as RNA polymerase. And most importantly, first carnet is a great agent. It doesn't need in doesn't need bioactivation. We said most of the antiviral drugs have to get activated by the viral or host cell enzymes. Foscarnet does not need activation. It is not dependent on the host cell kinase, not dependent upon the viral cell kinase. And naturally, even if the organisms do not have thymidine kinase and the organism is TK minus organism, still foscarnet can be useful. So those organisms who are resistant to acyclovir due to the production of TK minus strains, Foscarnet could be useful. Foscarnet is used by intravenous route of administration and as I just said, it's an alternative to acyclovir, janciclovir for the resistant strains, especially the TK minus strains of herpes simplex and herpes zoster. It's also an alternative to acyclovir for the management of CMV retinitis. So we discuss acyclovir and the drugs like acyclovir. Then we are discussing foscarnet. Coming to the adverse effects, foscarnet is also nephrotoxic and the nephrotoxicity could be dose limiting. It can lead to acute tubular necrosis. It can lead to genitourinary ulcerations and electrolyte imbalance or hypocalcemia. It can also produce neurotoxicity in the form of tremors and seizures. So please remember, many antivirals require 
phosphorylation by viral thymidine kinase but first carnate does not need this and TK- strains are those strains who do not have thymidine kinase enzyme at all and these viruses will be naturally resistant to the drugs which need activation by thymidine kinase. Now I have a table for you to look through. We are going to revise what are the drugs for various viral illnesses. HSV, acyclovir and the similar drug like FAM, VALA and pencyclovir, Janciclovir. There are more drugs in this group that Cidophobir and Vidarapine and if the organisms are resistant, you have Foscarnet. Next, herpes simplex keratitis, idoxyuridine or vidarapine. Influenza, influenza A and influenza A and B, I'm mentioning together amantadine, remantadine for A and oseltamivir, zanamivir for influenza A and B. Let's go to the next slide to complete the list of some other viral infections. Hepatitis B, think of interferon alpha 2B and hepatitis C, think of lamivudin, an antiretroviral agent, then ribavirin, then adofovir, sidofovir, and tinofovir. These are nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And lastly, you can also think of zidovudin or AZT. Next, CMV with retinitis, you have janciclovir, foscarnet, sidofovir, and fomivirsen. And especially to be remembered, for respiratory sensitial virus, you can use ribavirin or you can use a monoclonal antibody that's palivizumab, monoclonal antibody for RSV, respiratory sensitial virus is palivizumab. So this was a summary and two short tables for you to study for the viral infections which are non-retroviral. On another session, we are going to consider the retroviral illnesses, mainly HIV AIDS. I hope this short session was useful to you and I wish you good luck.